Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Hate You Later by Sierra Bloom. And this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Prologue. Alexa, play the Lit Lovers podcast. I listen while I prep the Celestial Pets Boutique for the day. Welcome to episode 27 of Lit Lovers, a male voice announces. We're your hosts, and this week we're talking about friction in the fiction. You know what we mean, enemies to lovers, cats and dogs. It's a classic trope, and there are almost too many books and movies to talk about with this one. Pride and Prejudice, chimes in one of the other hosts. You've got mail, says another. Ooh, ooh, the hating game, shouts the fourth. That's right. We're talking about love-hate relationships today. The first host speaks again. This week's episode is sponsored by the Grumpy Stump Axe Lodge, where Lit Lovers listeners enjoy 20% off all lanes on Saturday night. That's less than a buck per chuck. Drink and throw responsibly. Now let's get lit after the jump. The show's theme music comes on. I put away my old sewing machine that I used to finish my custom pet costumes and sweep up the fabric remnants and stray threads. Then I make my rounds, filling a hand-thrown ceramic pet bowl with gourmet dog treats to sample. I fluff the clothing on the round rack and straighten the selection of dog booties on the shoe shelf. Above the shoe shelves are two ledges holding miniature hat and wig stands. I smooth the peacock feathers sticking out of a green velvet top hat and bite my lower lip to contain the dopey smile that's threatening to bust out. Is there anything better than pet headwear? Probably not. Tiny hats and wiglets for pets are one of the few things truly right with the world. Anyone who's seen an iguana in a toupee will surely back me on this. So enlighten us, Jackson, a woman's voice teases from the podcast. Why are so many people turned on by people who piss them off? It's elemental, sis, the voice, the host replies. Ones and zeros, some of us are just programmed that way. Not me, I talk back at the podcast. I would describe my love life to date as tepid. At the ripe old age of 27, the one long-term relationship I've had was with one of my braided leather leash vendors. It had ended perfectly amicably. We'd fist bumped over our mutual breakup and we're still Facebook friends. He's engaged now to a nice girl who breeds collies. The last thing I want in my life is drama. My phone vibrates and I check the screen. It's a message from Oliver, my pet fluencer challenge buddy. Don't forget to play around with the portrait mode when shooting the lighting prompt today. Can't wait to see your photos. Suddenly, my boxer mutt cookie darts to the front of the shop, her hackles raised and ears twitching. It has to be a cat. Probably the stray that frequents the nearby alley. I stuff the phone in my back pocket and walk toward the window. Poor cookie, don't worry, I'll protect you, I say. I may only be five foot two, but I'm scrappy. Some people might think I got a dog for protection, but with a black belt and Kav Maga, I'm perfectly capable of defending myself. As I stand by the door, I stretch and gather my tousled black hair into a top knot. I push up my sleeves, exposing the tattoos twining up my left arm. Of all the designs, the tiny paw print with, made up of stars that decorates the inside of my wrist is my favorite. It's my own original design and also the logo for Celestial Pets. Cookie lets out a small nervous whine as she paces from the glass door to the shop window. Then she freezes by the door, staring out into the street. Creamy autumn morning light is streaming through the glass. It bathes her in the kind of warm golden glow that Instagram dreams are made of. I slide my phone from my back pocket. Quickly, I tap the screen, firing off a number of shots, zooming in and then pulling back. The moment doesn't last long. Perhaps the cat has moved on or perhaps I've distracted her with the photos, but a few seconds later, Cookie's tension abruptly falls away and she relaxes. She glances back at me, tail pumping when we make eye contact. Come here, good girl, I pat my legs, calling her over. With her tongue hanging out and the entire back end of her body wagging, Cookie dashes to my side, gazing at me with pure and utter devotion. Her hind leg jerkily thumps the floor as I scratch her, and then she rolls over onto her back for belly rubs. Shoot a few more pics, capturing her belly up in a delicious slice of sunshine. Talks are so much better than people, I tell myself for the billionth time. Chapter one, Georgia. Because my hand is curled into the perfect fist, thumb outside, finger straight, it really doesn't hurt too bad when my knuckles slam into Bryce Holmes' jaw. Actually, it feels good, really good. Cathartic even. He picked the wrong day and the wrong girl. That motherfucker had it coming. Let's back up about 25 minutes. 
We arrive at the onion fresh from work. Kenna drives because the unicorn, my ancient white Prius, is completely full of dog hair and Kenna is wearing black. This is fine with me. I suspect I'll need more than one drink tonight. The Onion is exactly the sort of place you want to go to when you need to bitch about something. The booths are a little greasy, the bar is a little grimy, the floor is a lot sticky. The bar food is not so great, but it's also not so terrible. It's exactly the sort of place you want to go to drown your sorrows, and since misery, misery loves company, it's always packed. There's always a battle over this playlist on the old-fashioned jukebox, and, but one thing everyone can agree on is their universal loathing of anyone who wears positive vibes only tees or employs a life coach. I love The Onion. The Onion is a safe haven from the plague of toxic positivity afflicting my generation, which is not to say I'm pro-negativity. I'm just a realist. No bullshit. No false hopes waiting to get dashed against the cliffs of reality. Kenna slides her skinny Levi's clad ass onto the bar stool beside me. She shed her barista apron and traded her colorful daytime scrunchie for a black bandana that matches her simple black sweater. Her silver stud earrings are mismatched. There's a coffee cup on the right and a camera on the left. And she has on an elaborately knotted friendship bracelet that I'm pretty sure I made for her a decade ago. This is about as fancy as my beautiful friend gets. There's a charming simplicity to her minimalist style. Kenna orders two micheladas and pays the bartender in cash, tipping generously. So, what are we going to do about the rent hike, she asks. Hmm, huh. rob a bank? Turn tricks. Buy a lottery ticket? I offer flippantly. Notice about the rent hike had come around noon today. It landed like a carpet bombing. Email and text messages blew up my inbox mere moments before the perky FedEx guy showed up at my door with the written notice. I'm certain there will be a certified letter arriving at Celestial Pets via snail mail as well. No claiming I didn't get this. It's a significant increase, nearly 30%, starting on November 1st, just a month and a half away. Is that even legal? I'm livid, but not entirely blindsided. Ever since the rumor started about the farm and home company doing some upgrades to the dump of a heuristic, historic building, where we've both been working since we were teenagers, this sort of scenario seemed inevitable. Who needs mom and pop shops when you can rent to Starbucks and Urban Outfitters? Can you ask Xander for help? Kenneth suggests. I shake my head and fold my arms defiantly across my chest. Not happening. I'm not going to beg my charity. I'm not going to beg for charity from my little brother. It isn't just the rent, it's everything. Celestial Pets is a philanthropic shop. It means most, if not all, of our profits go to support our local pet rescue, pet shelter, Kismet Rescue. And at the moment, Kismet is in dire straits. They've been displaced by another one of the farm and home company's renovation projects over in the industrial part of town. This sucks so much, Canada drums her fingers on the bar. You just finally worked out the relocation plan for the shelter. I'd found the perfect property outside of town at a farm that had a barn with existing kennels. But there's a lot of work to be done to upgrade the kennels for year-round use and to set up office space. Expensive work. Work that Kismet is relying on my shop to fund. Work that I've already taken out a mortgage on my house to fund. It's something I cannot think about right now without risking a full-blown panic attack. My heart beats jumpy, jump, jumpily, a caged bird. I'll figure it out. I'll just have to cut something. Is that any, if there's anything left to cut or borrow against. Seriously, Georgia, you should at least let Xander know. Kind of fixes me with the exasperated look of someone who's well aware her advice will probably be ignored. Xander and Mac are already doing so much. I fold my arms across my chest. My brother's partner has been keeping several homeless pets at his veter veterinarian clinic. He even set up a temporary desk in the office for Angie, the shelter's admin, to use to make calls and work on placements. You'd think that with the home family's history of selling pet supplies, they might have given a little more time and warning before evicting an animal shelter. Kenna shakes her head. Can't argue with that, but the Holmes had hardly seemed to give a shit. Bryce Holmes' heartless tweets were all over the local news. My phone dings with a text and I reach around for my, for my bag. It's hanging on the back of my bar stool along with my favorite shaggy faux fur jacket. Pro tip, the best way to disguise pet fur is to wear faux fur. I dig around to retrieve the phone in the depths of my cluttered vegan leather bag. The message is from Xander. 
He sent a link to his latest viral video and a paragraph's worth of star and champagne bottle emojis surrounding the text. One million views. Holy shit, that doggy groomed to look like a Pokemon character had received over a million views? As usual, I'm completely baffled by social media, but I'm so thrilled for him. Before putting my bag back, I collect three weeks' worth of loose change from the bottom to toss in the tip jar. My oversized ring catches on a crumpled up flyer for the online pet fluencer challenge I'm doing with my dog, Cookie. The challenge is being run through a local pet fanciers group and is sponsored by a high-end pet food brand that we carry in the shop. I smooth out the flyer and the bar. I'd agreed to help distribute the flyers, but then I'd signed up myself up on a whim. It couldn't hurt to play along. They have some mega influential moderators dishing out the weekly tips and post prompts. I'd love to grow a following for the shop in my original pet clothes designs. How's the challenge going? Can I asks. I groan. Ugh. It hasn't been going great, actually. In fact, it's been a month since I started and Cookie's Instagram account is still struggling to get following numbers beyond the double digits. Part of me wonders why I'm bothering. It's embarrassing, especially considering the wholly organic viral success of my mega influential little brother. I've stubbornly refused to ask him for help. I don't want to grow a following by a pity follows from his adoring fans. I just don't think I'm cut out for social media success. You you could ask. I know Ken is about to say Xander, but she holds her tongue when I turn my head to glare at her. She sighs. Fine then. If you hate it so much, I don't understand why you don't just drop it. Nobody would blame you for tabling that challenge for now. You have enough on your plate, don't you? She's right, of course, but I, I can't quit. Because it's not just my account at stake. The moderators have signed us all buddies, and if I fail, so does Oliver. The ridiculous cat. I can't let that furball down. I resist the urge to check if I have any messages from him. Texting daily has become part of our routine. So what about you guys? Will the rent hike hurt the diner? I attempt to steer the conversation away from myself. We'll be all right, Kenna says. The uncles are going to have to raise prices some, but they said they think they'll be okay, especially if the renovations bring more foot traffic. They're really looking forward to the building being upgraded. She looks almost apologetic. You know, my photography side also pays for my drinks, and I earn good tips at the diner. I could probably kick in some cash for you if you need it, Georgia. No, 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 stop it. You're already donating all your free time to take pictures of the animals. I don't need your tips. It's going to be fine. Got this. I lie. It won't be fine. The money I borrowed against the house is barely going to cover the shelter's moving and renovation expenses. I was counting on the shop's income to bridge the gap and guarantee that Angie still gets paid. Poor Angie. She's not getting any younger. I'm sure she relies on that meager salary. The bartender, a rangy 40-something guy with a graying soul patch, places her drinks in front of us. Can I get you ladies anything else? He asks. Chili fries, we both say almost, but not quite in unison. The bartender nods his approval before sending the order ticket onto the kitchen. Back to the pet fluencer challenge, Kenna says. You need any help with the photos? No, it's all got to be me. They want organic images, simple stuff. I take a sip of my drink, enjoying the way the salt, spice, and acid feel in my nearly empty stomach. Tomato juice, lime, and beer. Whoever came up with this recipe is a genius. Most of the prompts have been pretty casual so far, but if you've got the time, I could use a favor. That reporter who's doing a story on celestial pets asked for a few shots of the shop and my pet costumes. I'll pay you, of course. You got it, Kenna nods. Money is no good with me. Are you excited about the press? I've been trying not to put too much stock in it, but my one and only bright spot right now is that a nationally distributed pet magazine is doing a story on the shop, my designs, and the way we support local artists while funding our sister shelter. I, I guess we'll see. Hopefully it will help move the needle. Honestly, I'm not sure what to expect, and I don't want to get my hopes up. Kenna gives my arm a fast squeeze. It's going to be okay, G. We'll figure something out. I wish I had her confidence. I know, know she means well and genuinely wants to help, but it isn't her problem. It, it, it's mine. The weight of it all, the promise I made to the shelter, the commitment to keep up my mother's legacy, and ultimately the duty to make sure none of those animals end up in a kill facility sits so squarely on my shoulders. I take another long sip of my drink and scan the bar for a distraction. 
So this challenge, I tap the flyer in front of me. Want to hear the craziest part about it? I ask. Yes, please, Kenna replies, leaning forward and taking a big swig of her drink. Since it's online and we don't have any IRL interaction, we were assigned buddies. It's supposed to get us to engage more. We leave comments on each other's posts and we help each other with the prompts. I pull up my buddy's account on my phone and hand it to her. Check out my buddy. He's the weirdest cat. His personality is like a stuffy old-fashioned butler, like this really proper little old man. Oh my gosh, this shit is funny. Kind of scrolls past a photo of Oliver, the cat rejecting second-rate caviar and another of him fussily inspecting the hospital corners on his owner's tightly tucked bed. Where's his owner? She asks. I don't see anything about whose cat this is. That's the crazy part, I smile. We're not allowed to reveal who we are. We signed a contract at the start of the challenge to only interact with each other in the persona of our pets. It's like a whole method acting language immersion thing. No revealing our true identities. Really? Kenna quirks an eyebrow at me. So let me let me get this straight. You do Cookie and the other person does Oliver in all of your messages. What are they, like, texts? Please tell me you're not talking on the phone doing a do dog voice. She's looking at me now like I've lost it a little. No, we don't do voice chats. Mostly we leave each other messages in the challenge portal, but sometimes we chat too, I explain. Kenna bites her lip. This is clearly very amusing to her. I'm just trying to picture you pretending to be Cookie, G. I mean, you're just such a badass and Cookie is just so not. Kenna has tears forming in her eyes as she attempts to stifle her laughter. Hey, now, I defend my dog. I'm working on Cookie's image. Have you checked out her account? Kenna shakes her head. I know it seems a little weird, but it's actually been a lot of fun so far. Almost like doing improv and therapeutic in a weird way. I feel like I can say anything is Cookie. Mm-hmm, Kenna says. So tell us where the naughty doggy sniffed you. Not like that, I swatter with my napkin. Oliver's so uptight that I can't resist winding him up. Keep making Cookie's posts edgier and edgier just to see how he'll react. Oh, yeah, testing boundaries. You definitely would like that, you freak. Kenna leads forward and places her hand on her chin. This plays right into your whole bad girl wannabe thing. What do you mean, wannabe? Kenna snorts and rolls her eyes. You don't fool me. I know that deep down you're secretly a big soft EG. I don't know why you want everyone to think you're such a badass. Stop trying to fix me, Kenna. Exhale. I am what I am. She doesn't seem to get it. There's no room for weakness in my life. Helpless animals are relying on me. I might be able to stand letting down people but not pets. So are you going to show me your texts with this, Oliver? Kenna asks. No, I object, sliding my phone into my pocket. Definitely not. It's private. Oh, oh, really? Kenna presses on with renewed interest. This is sounding a little kinky, actually. I'm getting softcore porno vibes here. Maybe you should submit this story to the Lit Lovers podcast for an episode. I bet they'd have a field day with it. She sets down on her phone. You've been listening to too many episodes, I chide. Maybe, she shrugs, but tell me, have you given any thought about what Oliver's, Oliver's owner is like IRL? What if it's that guy over there? He looks like he might have a high-maintenance Persian cat in his life. Kind of tilts her head toward a grizzled, bandana-capped biker who's arm wrestling in the corner. I think he's got room for an entire litter of kittens in that beard. Stop! I try not to snarf my drink. The truth is, I have wondered about Oliver's owner, but that's beside the point. I, I can't go there, I say. It's probably a little old lady or some nerdy teen. It doesn't really matter. I push the flyer away from me to make room for the bartender to sit down our chili fries. Before I can even lift my fork, Kenneth snakes her hand under mine, spearing the first fry. Too slow! She laughs and bites into her chili sauce to french fry. Her eyes half closed, she moans with delight. Oh, God, I wish I could date these fries. Those fries are totally your type, I laugh. Dirty, spicy, terrible for you. They're perfect, she agrees. Wouldn't change a thing. That's probably why you wouldn't date these fries. You have nothing to fix, I point out. Kenneth shrugs. Then I'd marry them. She holds up the fry mouths, the words, I do, and then proceeds to kiss the French fry before plopping it in her mouth. She has sauce drip, drippings on her chin and winks as she accepts a napkin. Suddenly, she freezes mid-dap. 
I've got it. The solution to all our problems. You should marry a home. Kenna punctuates her proclamation by shaking another chili fry at me. I duck to avoid an airborne droplet of meat sauce. Hear, hear me out. You could take over the company, save the shelter, and get some help in the shop so you'd be free to live a life of luxury and leisure. She pronounces leisure like leisure with a fake British accent. I'd rather marry that biker in the back corner than Bryce Holm, I gag for effect. Kenna and I went to high school with Bryce Holm, the entitled pompous, arrogant stepson of the head of the Holm company. He was a couple of years ahead of us and infamous, the perfect amalgam of every teen movie villain minus the good hair. Doesn't Bryce have an older brother? His dad was married before Bryce's mom, European woman. I think she went back there with the kid. Don't know, don't care. I shrug and shudder. Bryce Holm. Blech. As if on cue, summoned from the murky depths, I spy him coming toward us. Seconds later, I feel his hot, boozy breath on the side of my neck. Talk about manifesting. Is nothing sacred anymore? What the hell is he doing in the onion? Did I hear someone say my name? Can I buy you ladies a drink? I sneak a glance over my shoulder. It's been a decade since high school and the lights in the bar are dim, but I recognize Bryce Holm all the same. His fa he's fatter and his hair is thinning, it, but the signature swagger hasn't changed. Same old smug-ass douchebag. His golf polo pressed increased jeans and flashy watch are ridiculously at odds here in The Onion. I don't know if he remembers us, but we certainly remember him. Kenna and I exchange a look. Her eyes are wide and horrified. Sorry, she mouths as if she conjured him up with a chili fry. Bryce insinuates himself into the narrow space between me and the empty chair to my left. No, thanks. We're all good here, I say, refusing to meet his eyes. Not that I'm in any danger of that. I'd have to have eyes in my, DD, my double Ds to meet his present gaze. Come on, whatever you want, princess, he smirks, snapping his fingers officiously to get the bartender's attention. The bartender looks my way with a wary glance that asks, You okay? Catelli's struggling to remain impassive as he, I nod almost imperceptibly. It appears that Bryce Holm has leveled up on the douchebag scale. His left hand, casually placed on the bar, sports a sausage-like ring finger with a diamond-studded wedding band. It's so ostentatious, it almost looks fake. I'm surprised you weren't trying to get us to pay for you, I mumble, still refusing to turn to face him. I can feel moist heat radiating off of him as he angles himself toward me. I instinctively lean away toward Kenna. Come on, princess, don't you remember who I am? He leans in closer. He's wearing too much cologne. Barf. I count to five, taking stock of each of my fingers as I arrange them neatly into a fist. Try me. Uh-oh, Kenna mutters under her breath. I'm more than ready when Bryce Holm places his right hand on my shoulder, spinning me out to face him. His lizard eyes dart between my mouth and my boobs, and his hand slides down my spine to the small of my back. He licks his lips. And then he's down. The pain blooming in my knuckles is nothing compared to the satisfaction of seeing the befuddled expression on Bryce's face as his precious denim-clad ass makes contact with the beer tacky floor of the onion. I shake out my hand and blow on my knuckles to cool them off. Bryce's face is a roadmap of shock pure shock. Then he squints, revealing rivers of pain. Finally, his face floods red. Anger. What the fuck? He grabs onto a table to pull himself up and snatches a napkin, sending silverware flying dramatically. He spits into the napkin, inspecting it, looking for blood. Oh, come the fuck on. I didn't hit you that hard, I say. His balance just sucks. But there'd be a bruise. For sure, there would be a bruise. Did you see that? Bryce gestures to Kenna and the bartender. The bartender shrugs impassively and fills a plastic cup with ice, which he then hands to Bryce. I think you asked for it, ma'am, he says. She's a black belt. You're damned lucky you still have your balls. Kenna sighs. She puts a $20 bill on the bar and then puts, pulls on her coat before laying a tentative hand on my shoulder to get my attention. She holds out my furry coat. Let's get out of here, she says. My heart is still pounding, and if anything, I'm overheated but I humor her and slip into the coat. You stupid bitch, don't you know who I am? Bryce says again. With a sullen huff, he plunks himself down at the bar in the space we vacated, ice pressed to his jaw. Oh, I know exactly who you are, I sneer, picking up the remains of my drink, 
ready to pour it on him if the opportunity arises. The bruise will heal, but there's no way he'll be able to get a Michelada stain out of his pressed pants. It sent he that loser who barfed all over himself at homecoming. Kenneth speaks loudly enough for half the bar to be reminded of one of Bryce's less proud moments. She takes the cup out of my hand and nudges me toward the door. Come on, G, she pleads. It's not worth it. But the animals, I say. What about his tweets about my, the shelter pets? I'm this close to throwing the drink in his face. I'm at this point. I realize that all around us, people are holding up their cell phones, filming us. You're not going to be able to help any animals from a prison cell. Kind of speaks low and calm into my ear and places my bag on my shoulder. Fine, I say begrudgingly. I pause to glare one last time at Bryce. He's using one hand to hold the cup to his jaw and he is furiously texting someone with the other. I have witnesses, I warn. You're clearly never heard of personal space. Kenna grabs a fistful of fur and drags me to the door. It reminds me of the way a mother cat moves her kittens. Time to go, G. She firmly shoves me through the exit. I'm expecting a rush of cold air night air as she pushes me, a sharp contrast to the heat radiating from me and the close atmosphere inside. But instead, my breath is knocked out of me as I run smack into a wall, a solid wall of a man sheathed in a dark gray sweater. The sweater is soft, at least. I notice my cheek slides across his chest. Cashmere has to be cashmere. Oof. Hey, watch where you're going, he says. Only when he notices I'm not breathing does he ask. You okay? I gasp. His large warm hands come to my shoulders to steady me, but they don't linger there long enough to give me any excuses to swing. I shove him back instead. My head is swimming. I'm feeling a little disoriented, which I chalk up to having the air knocked out of me, plus the Michelada and too much adrenaline in my system. She's fine, Kenneth says, squeezing out the door behind me. We were just leaving. Or trying to, I croak. The man and I do the same, the, that thing where we both step in the same direction in an attempt to get around the each other and end up colliding again. What the hell? He looks annoyed. Does he think I'm doing this on purpose? Is he? Maybe pick a side, he suggests haughtily. Because he's backlit by the blinding neon sign just outside the door, I'm seeing more silhouette than details. Can't quite make out his face beyond the impression of chiseled features. He's slim, but solid. Slicked back, medium length hair, clean. He smells great, actually. Shampoo, wood smoke, and a hint of wet wool. He's so tall, I'm not so sure I could take him, but I'd really like to try, I suddenly think. Well, where did that even come from? Must be all the adrenaline. This is a totally different way of thinking and the of thinking that has me wrestling with this stranger and not minding if he ends up on top inappropriate thoughts that I have no space for my heart is still pounding wildly I have to get out of here I duck past him and race walk toward the parking lot but I swear I can still feel his eyes on me all the way to the car and somewhat perversely it's not a problem I actually like the feeling of him watching me laser focused like a cat hunkering down and following its prey Shouldn't like it so much, should I? Kenna and I sit in the car and catch our breath in the quiet for a moment. She shakes her head and turns to look at me. I rub my sore knuckles and stare at my hands. They're shaking. You sure you're okay, Georgia? Kenna asks. I shove my hands into my pockets. Yeah, I I'm fine, totally fine, I bluff. You know me, I've always hated the Holmes. Yeah, I, I know. Kenna puts the car in gear and spares me her knowing gaze. Plus, that hottie in the doorway really blew your big dramatic exit, didn't he?